Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Larry Kessler. Today's episode features the 2023 George Sarton Memorial Lecture in the History and Philosophy of Science. The lecture is given at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science by a distinguished practitioner in the history of science. This year's lecture was delivered on March 4th by Laura Stark, historical sociologist and associate professor at Vanderbilt University. Professor Stark's lecture is titled, Who Does the Work of Science? A Century of Science is Passion, Punishment, and Paycheck. Just to kick things off, really want to thank uh, Maya Johnson with the AAAS and who's doing a lot of the organizing for the meeting. She's been really tremendous in making everything run smoothly. So a major shout out to the folks who are doing the work of keeping our conference running. So I'd also like to thank JP Gutierrez. Can you just give a wave? who is from our affiliated organization, the History of Science Society. So if anybody here also wants to learn more about the History of Science organization and the relationship with the section here, chat with JP and also check out the History of Science Society. So I also want to just thank you for joining this conversation, and I'm really looking especially forward to the Q&A and to um, really start a a conversation about these questions. And finally, um, I also just want to note that we are on the traditional lands of Native communities, many forcibly removed and forcibly assimilated by the U.S. government, my my government, and looking at the AAAS program and also the work that many of you here are doing, I just want to say that it's very good to see the commitment to Native sovereignty and um, Native justice that's growing. First, to start off with my own work, I uh, would like to be the first to uh, wish you a very happy March 4th. It's a movement, not a day. So pictured here is a book published four years ago to commemorate the day that started this movement in 1969. It was on this day, March 4th, that scientists and graduate students at MIT, Harvard, Cornell, and many other institutions organized a political action. In classic academic fashion, they referred to it verbosely as a research stoppage. Newspaper headlines, though, called it as they saw it. The researchers were on strike. The March 4th movement spawned a number of organizations, including the Union of Concerned Scientists. The scientists' uh, protests interrupted the AAAS uh, annual meetings, this sort of annual meeting in 1969, 1970, and 1971. It also afforded a few changes in the AAAS organization itself to respond to the sorts of demands scientists were making for social justice. They were protesting the uses of science and wanted a say in the distribution of the risks of science, the imbalances of access to resources in science, and especially the use of science at that time for war. They demanded a say in creating more just labor markets and science workplaces that were more equitable. And so what I'd like to do today with our time here is to explore the questions that this movement raised. What were the impacts of science that we are all doing? And what were the work conditions for scientists? What happens if we recognize science as a workplace where there is a lot of passion for sure, but also a workplace like any other questions? These are the issues that science communities are echoing today and making demands around for uh, new and fresh ways of arranging workplaces, for exploring the mutual impacts of science for humanity, as our theme indicates. So I'd like to explore these questions together through a very curious, and I would like to um, suggest a very important group of people, the normals. These were the people who served in the U.S. government's own internal medical experiments at the U.S. National Institutes of Health starting in the 1950s and continuing today, though the program takes a very different form, as I'll describe. They were part of what was called the Normal Volunteer Patient Program. And as a historian of science, for me, these people, the normals, were a pretty big problem because they were happy. Over the past decade, I've done oral histories with more than 125 normals and the scientists who researched on them starting in the 1950s. 
And the normals insist on being represented as such, as really quite eager to, um, to do this form of labor for science. Many went on to careers in the health professions, and others just regarded it as a rather whimsical thing that they did in their 20s that I can kind of imagine some of us can relate to. They're kind of inexplicable why they did that when they were in their 20s. And while I'm committed to fairly representing their stories at an individual level, the great benefit and necessity of history of science is to identify and to show the patterns that can be gathered from individual stories when combined with archival evidence. So a spoiler alert. Via the normals, I want to show the broader structural injustices, inequalities, as well as the opportunities for uh, political action embedded in the labor systems of science that they were working within. And history is always emergent, as the story also shows. People coming together, science communities, us, can and indeed actively are working in science towards more just futures. So just to uh, uh, make clear, the happy human subject is a problem because the stories of human experimentation that are most familiar to us are both tragic and true and are stories of racial injustice that persist in the United States um, and, and elsewhere in the present day. Perhaps best known is the story of Henrietta Lacks. Many of you also, I would imagine, know um, the Tusk Tuskegee syphilis studies, which have been going on for four decades and uh, widely published in the scientific press before they were popularly sort of quote unquote, revealed in the early 1970s thanks to a CDC whistleblower on the heels of the civil rights movement. So we got specific rules in 1974 for the appropriate treatment of human subjects. These rules, the National Research Act, ushered in the institutional review board system that many of us work within today. And this history and how the rules took the particular form that they do and the ways in which they require scientists now to make decisions was the subject of my prior project behind closed doors. And I should mention that the rules of the National Research Act were updated in uh, 2018 in the, Obama, the waning days of the Obama administration, but they've largely uh, remained in place with very little change since then. And I can talk more about that and have conversations with you about that. But for today, I'm talking about my, uh, my current project, The Normals, and it's based on extensive uh, research in more than two dozen historical archives, including federal archives, church collections, university holdings, and many more. I requested and received Freedom of Information Act release of more than 1,000 pages. for the, uh, This was an original release. And I conducted more than 100, so more than 125 oral histories with former normals, as well as scientists, as I've mentioned. So to give you a sense of the material that I'm looking at, and that is now collected in the Vernacular Archive of Normal Volunteers, which is a free publicly accessible archive at the Harvard Medical School's History Library, that the materials look something like this. So this is a former normal. His name is Dale Horst, and this is a picture of him right before he went to the clinical center to be in normal in 1954. In 2011, I flew to Kansas, where Dale now lives, um, and did an oral history with him. And at that time, I'd found him through, uh, through archives. At that time, he also dug out boxes that he had still in his attic and under his bed, which included things like candid photos, of uh, the things he got up to with other normals at the clinical center, like having a pillow fight. Cards, letters that he wrote and were written back to him while he was at the clinical center. And on the bottom uh, you left, you can see a card upon his departure since he had been there for two years serving as a normal, signed by Nobel laureates, as well as uh, some very bad poetry that I will spare you from, um, from reading. I think Dale would be okay with me, with me describing it that way, uh, while he was there as well. So it's very intimate, very, very uh, meaningful and rich material. So how did this program come into place? In the years after World War II, science agencies were riding high on the big budgets after the truly remarkable research accomplishments of World War II. 
and patriotism was undeniably high. Among the best-known breakthroughs were um, the atomic energy research and weapons, and uh, one that's held up a little bit better under moral scrutiny, the mass production of penicillin during World War II. This, these and other breakthroughs were made possible by federal funding of the biosciences that was really strong, so public money for science. And this lesson was not lost on Congress, that science plus money equals breakthroughs, and the wars didn't stop. After World War II, the U.S. maintained a military presence on the Korean Peninsula, and what the U.S. calls the Korean War officially started in 1950 and officially ended in 1953, but U.S. state violence continued in Southeast Asia and around the globe, including the military actions that the scientists' March 4th movement were protesting the war in Vietnam, and university contracts for government research to support war. The military draft continued without interruption from World War II until the mid-1970s. And this is important to know because it was in this war context, ongoing hot wars and eventually Cold War II, that the U.S. Congress set funding for science research with public money on a climbing course for decades to come. In budget terms, the wars were great news for the U.S. National Institutes of Health, the federal agency that I'm focusing on today. As you know, NIH's main campus is in Bethesda, Maryland, but it had only recently moved to Bethesda onto a big piece of real estate from more decidedly modest handful of laboratories that are actually not far from us now. They're just towards the mall in the direction of Georgetown. On the Bethesda campus in the 1950s, there was enormous construction and even bigger ambitions for what a well-funded, thoroughly managed scientific center could look like. And this is a picture of the NIH Clinical Center as it was under construction and just about to open. So the story I'm focusing on is set inside the Clinical Center. And this is the place where scientists were taking all of the great bench research that was being done on the campus and using it for the first time often in people, or they were just simply uh, trying to figure out at this time using technologies like radioisotopes what, how the human body actually worked. So part of it was what we would now call translational research, but other was just simply uh, data gathering about human bodies and standards. So when the 1953, or in 1953, the construction was done, government dignitaries came for the dedication ceremony, and the clinical center opened. And then the practical realities of the world brought their blue sky thinking down to earth. Scientists were tough to recruit for a lot of reasons that I can chat about more in, um, in the Q&A. And some of the materials they needed for research were astoundingly hard to get. And most of all, the material that they needed were healthy people to be the subjects of medical experiments. And this was because NIH's clinical center had one really un unintuitive requirement. You could only be admitted to the hospital if you agreed to be in experimental research. And so put more delicately, you could only be admitted to the clinical center if you were enrolled in a study. Now, for people who were sick, this was not so much of a problem. I mean, it was cutting-edge research, and uh, the treatment that people were getting, though experimental, was also free. But getting healthy people, this was a really a different matter. In the years after World War II, it was really morally unimaginable and definitely legally unprecedented to do experiments on people who weren't sick. And I should say, people who had full civil rights and were white. This was who people who could sign contracts. This was really big scale research that needed to be totally, fully visible by the federal government. So NIH needed a steady and really large supply of people who were full civilians. They could sign consent forms and a supply that'd be ongoing into perpetuity and operating at scale. And they'd have to move inside the clinical center for several months and do it for free. So no uh, sort of steady job, no problem leaving uh, family or any sorts of obligations wherever they lived. They just packed a bag and they moved into the hospital. This was the plan. On moral grounds alone, much less uh, personal finance, the clinical center leaders had no idea how they could pull this off. And then, as the Korean War was heating up, the clinical center leaders actually got a call from an organization called the Historic Peace Churches in 1951. This was an organization that represented the big three pacifist churches 
So uh, the ones that I'm going to focus on today are um, the Mennonite Church and the Church of the Brethren. For reasons I can also go into, the Quaker Church, the third of them, actually did, uh, declined to get involved with the Normals program. So these churches had originally uh, negotiated with the U.S. Selective Service during World War II to find non-combat placement for their conscientious objectors who were drafted to fight. And after the war, each of the three churches, they had actually created what they called a normal volunteer program to expand service for peace. And it was sort of like missionary service, but with a little bit of a lower uh, lower commitment. A lot of the placements were in the United States, and they were for, for shorter terms. And what is really, really important is that the, the voluntary research programs for these churches were not restricted to conscripts. They weren't restricted to people who were drafted. They were open to anyone, which meant women, uh, people who were older, retirees, for example. And the programs for the churches were so popular that it actually created a problem of their own, which was that they had so many people they couldn't find enough placements for them for, to do this Christian pacifist witnessing through service. So the two organizations, the Historic Peace Churches and National Institutes of Health, became the solutions to each other's problems. If I had to pick a date that set in place the foundation for our current massive multi-million dollar global market for human subjects, the year would be 1954. This was the year that the U.S. government signed its first procurement contracts with the Mennonite Church and the Church of the Brethren for Healthy Human Subjects. And again, no doubt, um, experimental research had, has been done on people for time immemorial. Often it was on sick people and people without full civil rights. And what was also unprecedented was that these full, these, these healthy people were really coming anonymously, having no relationship with the researchers, and there were, uh, there was going to be a large scale market for them. And the first group arrived in the spring of 1954. So, because this was a federal government, these had to be contract organizations. So these could not be individual people. This is really important. Uh, the federal government could only sign contract for research materials with the equivalent of what we would call vendor organizations today. So you can see the, this is a budget list pulled out of the archives at the National Archives in, in College Park. And at the bottom, you can see that the line item is for volunteer service and another one for volunteer service. And um, the recipient, the contract organization, is the General Brotherhood Board. So this is the, uh, the Church of the Brethren. And the, the next line down is the Mennonite Central Committee. So the U.S. government signed contracts with these organizations for, to provide people for human subjects research. And what I really want to um, flag was that the churches negotiated for their normals to get volunteer uh, placements in the hospitals to make sure in these negotiations that the normals were really getting a good deal. So I want to sort of flag the role that the organization served as, as quasi-unions, to be sure the organizations were also getting funding. So they were getting a 10% overhead sort of payment. We can think of it as something like a finder's fee for sending the normals. Um, but they were also advocating um, to make sure that the normals had the things that they needed while they were living within the hospital. Many of the normals wanted to start taking classes because it was uh, boring when they were not on study um, and living inside this hospital. And so the organizations, the leadership were uh, negotiating with the federal government to be able to sure, be sure that there were structural arrangements that worked for what the normals wanted because they were doing something like collective bargaining with the government. So this is a, an article from the NIH record, which is still published today. This one was from the 1950s, and this was the time when the first normals came to NIH. You can see what was described as a motorcade arriving in uh, the picture in the middle of the screen, and then a, a nice staged photo of the very first arrival of the normals. And one of the lines uh, to, at the start says, recruited through the service centers, the Mennonite and Brethren churches, this special group of young men and women are taking advantage of an opportunity to earn, learn, and to serve at the same time. So an opportunity to earn, learn, and serve. They were human subjects. 
And they were also, bear in mind, pacifists, very committed to their religious life. This was the orientation of their life, um, not necessarily earning a paycheck. They were there in studies for the Heart Institute, uh, the Cancer Institute, what is today NIDDK, uh, metabolic disease, NIMH, uh, mental health, uh, and more. And the, these pictures here are one of the normals in a sweat study for, uh, for the metabolic research, um, just in a really highly uh, heated chamber, and they're uh, collecting her sweat. And this is one of the studies in which the normals themselves actually uh, had to really work as a group. They got a microphone um, and, an, and an audio system to kind of cheer on the people who were in the sweat studies, because they had to do it for a long time and many of them were really vulnerable to dropping out. So there was kind of this enrollment of the normals in mutually sustaining the research uh, so that the researchers could actually get the data that they needed. You can also see here uh, on the top left, this is a study uh, for psychotropic drugs. So this person is actually Dale Horst, the person I was showing in the earlier slides. And he was uh, kind of like a, a poster child because he was a very enthusiastic early uh, human subject and he was there for two years serving his draft term. And he is on LSD in this picture. And the researchers are trying to figure out what LSD does to people. And this is in the 1950s. They stopped this research in 1960. <laughs> Underneath that is a, a thyroid study. And you can see also the nature of this photograph. So these aren't the normals candidates. These are recruitment photographs that NIH took themselves in order to uh, try to get more people through the service churches. And the article on the right reproduces these photographs. So what I want to do is show you both the original photograph and also um, be able to see what NIH was imagining when they were taking these photographs in the first place, that, it, th that this would look appealing, that this would be a great way to try to get more normals into their research. But by the end of the 1950s, the NIH researchers started to have a concern. The normals were there because science was a passion and it was way, a way to witness service for peace, according to their, their own church orientations. And the researchers actually found this to be an uncommon and therefore potentially pathological relationship with the paid labor market. So they actually thought it was strange for people to um, not really need that much pay and to actually sacrifice that much for science. They themselves were seeing science as more of a work-a-day sort of endeavor, one that was no doubt important that they had great passion about, but not to this extent. And they started to actually question their research, everything from the mental health research uh, to uh, the metabolic research. What would it mean if it turned out all the people they were categorizing as normal were actually pathological? And they had this real fear at the end of the 1950s. And it was especially striking and bracing for them, uh, the researchers, because all of the research at NIH on normal people for the whole decade of the 1950s was done on members of these two church organizations. They're all either Mennonite or Church of the Brethren people. So from here, NIH decided that they had the procurement contract mechanism, and so they knew how to do this. They knew how to get normals. They would just start signing contracts with other organizations, and this is what they did. They expanded the number of contracts they signed. They started signing with um, colleges in particular, uh, and especially colleges that had a work-study requirement built into their curriculum. So um, Bennington College, for example, had, had this, um, Antioch College in Ohio, many small, very progressive pedagogical models were, sending, were signing contracts and sending their normals for work experience to NIH. But this is also a moment when um, the program takes a bit of a darker turn that um, is, is um, even at its own time, uh, impossible, I would say, to defend. And the Normal Volunteer Patient Program also had an arrangement for getting thousands of normals 
and it was not with a, co a contract relationship. So there was no outside organization that served as a quasi-union to negotiate with NIH. If many of the, the colleges who didn't like the treatment of the normals, they ended their contracts. So I want to emphasize, in addition to the sort of the dark uh, incentive structure for the organizations themselves for signing the contracts, the way in which they were operating for collective action among among their normals. Um, and I, but I think it's uh, important for for historical accuracy to flag another program that NIH took part in, in which they brought thousands of federal prisoners by bus or by airplane to, uh, they flew into DC and were brought to the clinical center and they lived on the 11th floor in a locked ward 25 at a time and they were exclusively used in infectious disease research. They uh, were all incarcerated in federal prisons and this was work as a human subject that was regarded too dangerous and uh, too experimental to use full civilians in the research, people with full civil rights. And so on the one hand, NIH was announcing this program themselves. In 1964, NIH brought in its 1,000th prisoner for research. The program continued at NIH until the end of the 1960s, and at this point, the variant of the U.S. civil rights movement that is m more closely associated with the Black Power movement, so the sort of the later the later stages uh, of the 90s, the later moments of the 1960s, started to ramp up, and this was these, this was a moment of real focus on incarceration in particular, and um, I can say more um, in the Q and A, but these intentional infection experiments were were dangerous, and NIH knew it uh, and found it fairly early on. They ended the program in the 1960s um, before the program caught broader public attention when, they, when the seas started to change for NIH regarding their feelings about and pride in this program. And here, NIH again ramped up its contracts with uh, small colleges, often nursing colleges, as I said, work-study col colleges. And this was from an interview that I did in 2017 with a college student, and this is, uh, this is Janet on the bottom right. And at the time, remember, this is 2017, not 2020, she told me a story of needing to then do intentional infection experiments because the prisoner program had ended. She didn't know the historical context that she was being enrolled in these now because the prisoner program had ended. And I now still needed people for the intentional ex uh, infection experiments. And she told me she had an enormous crush on the researcher who was, who was involved in the studies for her, and that was Tony Fauci. And <laughs> so she had such a crush before Tony Fauci was a household name that she wrote him a piece of fan mail around 2000, and she had saved it, and she saved his reply which is the sweetest thing. And so this is, this is the, uh, the reply letter from Tony Fauci. Uh, he was a good guy even then. So I just want to flag this historical context and also allow you to see the, how these individual stories, when placed in this broader context and structure of history, we can see these in, in two different lights, at the in scale of an individual life and at the scale of organizational programs and the course of how scientific research is conducted. At the end of the 1970s, the American government, the U.S. economy, was in fairly dire straits, and this trickled down in classic Reagan-esque form as he was just starting his administration in 1981, trickled down to very hard financial times for federal agencies. It was a moment of privatization and deregulation, and NIH also felt the pinch, and were looking for ways to cost-save. They did so by deciding they were going to actually decrease the number of contracts they signed. So there would no longer be these, these vendor contracts, the organizations that were negotiating and setting the terms in which the normals would serve, and sort of um, troubleshooting for the normals. And I started recruiting at an individual level. And this is the structure of recruitment that we're, we're more familiar with today, where it is a big organization, an institution, a hospital, an agency that is signing consent forms with individual people. 
there's very little opportunity for pushback, rearrangement of how this is all going to happen. And instead, it is a big agency, NIH, with great esteem and power, signing contracts with individual people. And I began recruiting locally at local colleges like the University of Maryland. They would go to science classes and give a pitch. They, uh, they went to uh, frat group meetings and gave pitches. And they got people to come in who did not need to live at the clinical center because they were local. So no room, no board. They could pay their own transportation. And NIH's hope was that they would really be able to save quite a bit of money by doing it this way. And it may not be entirely coincidental that this was also the moment, 1980, that the Normals program suffered a major tragedy. It was the first death of a normal while serving on a study. She was on a sleep study, um, and the researchers uh, thought that the technology had uh, malfunctioned, but she had actually passed away, which was why her heart rate was no longer registering. The young woman was from Bethesda, so she was recruited locally, and she was 23 years old, a nursing student, and she died in April of 1980. She was one of nine, so you can see a, a Christmas picture of, the, of all the siblings, one of nine siblings. Um, and over the past 10 years, I've gotten to know uh, the family, and then over this past year, we had enough of a relationship where I did um, oral histories with the, the, um, the eight surviving siblings. So this tragedy was covered in the news at this, the time, and it was discussed in retrospect in terms of ethical lapses, both among the scientists, but also among Bernadette herself, um, who did not fully disclose relevant health information. But what I want to do is to pull away from these standard ethical framings of a doctor-patient relationship, and this is the only place where ethics is unfolding or the researcher-subject relationship. Because these villain and victim framings rob attention from the more substantial and enduring structural issues in scientific research. So I want to highlight, again, that NIH had shifted away from signing contracts with, um, with the organizations, and then we're signing at an individual level. So to wrap up, the Normal Volunteer Patient Program continues today, though it has a new name and a new office. It is that it works primarily at an individual level. And I'd like to close my story of the program from the 1950s to the 1980s with two big observations. So the first, looking back at all the normals I've spoken with, whom I saw in newspaper articles and met in various historical traces in the archives, one pattern is unmistakable. They were all white. To be normal was to be white. Decades of data set the standards for a normally functioning human body, and they were all calibrated to white bodies. Okay. This is a reunion of the happy normals in 2007. This was right before I started working on the project, so I didn't speak with them, but this was one of the things they had in their boxes under the beds as well. But the second thing that I want to focus on as well is that the normals were white through the 1980s, because the contract organizations were racially homogenous, either through active racial discrimination or through the structural barriers that forestalled access to college education, union membership, participation in a given church for black and brown communities. And I didn't create the white norm alone. It was through contracts with agency that, with these uh, organizations, that they enacted a sort of second order discrimination. So the contract organizations had many flaws, but one of the shining strengths ethically was that they advocated for their members as quasi-unions. The story of the normals, which tapered into the individual recruitment program, shows what happens when forms of labor are turned into gig work. So my point is not that human research should never be done. Rather, my point is to show what happens when people working in science as human subjects and unpaid lab techs were part of an organization that advocated for them. By tracing the history of, of understanding of science, that I hope that my talk today can suggest how science might be done differently. And one of the, uh, I think, great things to see is work like this by uh, one of the speakers uh, on the program, is a co-author on this, 
Evelyn Hammond, who's also speaking later today and spoke last night, and uh, is also among us with the History of Science Society. And this article underscores um, a few points that I, uh, that I think bear um, reiterating, that within the academy, universities must examine how they support research and how they structure the spaces and incentives that shape how research teams form. And have to address the lack of incentives and underlying structural barriers that too often prevent full participation, even when people from underrepresented groups, black and brown communities, are included. So I'd like to close with a few examples of how this kind of work is being done and transformative science is getting done. First, the Native Biodata Consortium. This is a biobank and research lab led by and done by Native indigenous scientists. The lab is located on, the, on Native lands in South Dakota, and they're doing research on bioscience issues that are most important to their communities, but they're also rearranging the terms in which genetic data is being used from their community. So they are, hold, they are holding it in their biobank um, in, 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 on their traditional lands in, in current South Dakota. Um, and Crystal Sotsi is one of the board members, also one of my colleagues at Vanderbilt, um, and the, shown the second one in, in this picture here. Another example I'd like to highlight is a CLEAR a Plastics and Environmental Science Laboratory that's actually based in Canada that describes itself as a feminist anti-colonial research laboratory. And they nicely document how this actually translates into workaday practice in their clear lab book, which sets out everything from the mundanities of how you actually run a meeting to how you divvy up resources and make decisions together. So to close, the past tells us how we got to today and how to read our lives in everyday historical relief. It also shows that history is not predetermined which is to say that people, that we have agency. We can take political action to change history's status quo. So happy March 4th. May we all remember it's a movement, not a day. Thank you. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. To learn more about this topic, visit our website at chstm.org.